then I'm going to start sharing it on Facebook Live. And I'm going to give everybody another minute to get on here. You know that traffic in the Victorian streets, right? It just, it's so backlogged. It needs the time to get in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll be talking about that, right? <laughs> Preparing live stream preview. All right, well, I've not done that before, so we'll see how it works. It's Facebook, what could go wrong? <laughs> Well, oh, getting lots of nice chats. Excellent. Nice to see everybody. We'll get everybody on there anyway. Um, if I type in what this is called, people could join us on Facebook Live, I think. It seems to be working. All right, well, we'll go from there. All right, should we start? Um, it is 6.30. I'm feeling funerally dressed and underlit, which is good. Uh, thank you to everybody who's on. I see 130 participants on so far. Um, my name is Gareth Evans. I'm the director of the Bellamy Museum. It's nice to be actually doing educational programming uh, via Zoom is actually, we've just been talking about this, a really nice way of doing it. So. Um, if you've got your champagne there, that's good. There's a couple of housekeeping things that we do when we start these Zoom sessions. Um, please, if you will, it should be that you're all muted. It's a webinar set up for this one. If you see that you're not and the dog barks or whatever else, please mute and that will be grand. We are being recorded uh, here and we'll play this later for folks who couldn't make it um, and share that in the various places that you share that, YouTube and via our website and elsewhere. We're also gonna do uh, questions at the end. You'll see at the bottom, somewhere in the middle, uh, a Q&A um, button. If you'll put any questions in there, while Michaela's talking, I'll monitor that, write them down, and we'll do the questions at the end. I'll ask her on behalf, because again, if I unmute you all, there'll be 144 people all talking at once, and that won't be much fun. Uh, so we'll do it that way, if you don't mind. And I'll get on and do my introduction, uh, Dr. Michaela Howells is a UNCW Assistant Professor of Anthropology. She's got a PhD from Boulder, Colorado and studies medicine in terms of anthropology, health, education, and well, now we just found out vampires, but that's something else, um, which is another talk we're gonna have to do. And of course, Victorian morning practices, which is what we're gonna talk about today. I hope you're all dressed appropriately uh, for this. I'm gonna ask her to say a few words, share, share the screen and then off we'll go. Okay, fabulous. Thank you so much for having me and thank you all of you for joining us today and, and taking the time to really dive into this incredible world. Um, I do want to let you know before we get started that there will be some images of actual dead people um, within this. Um, they are tastefully uh, photographed. They are photographed with love from their families, but I do think it's important that you should know that ahead of time. Um, I will also be speaking towards the end about uh, more specifically about our um, cultural transition, especially associated with death and dying and, and COVID. And so if that's a topic that you find um, challenging um, or one that is a little too close to home right now, uh, do be aware, but that will be, uh, it'll be clear when I'm talking about how this how this fits with our lives now and today. So please do put any questions you have in the chat. Um, we'd love to be able to get through those. Um, my section of the talk is going to be about 40 minutes long, um, but we certainly want to be able to um, capture your, your thoughts as we go. Okay, now everybody hold your breath, say a prayer that my sharing screen works. So give me one moment here. <laughs> Pressing all the right buttons. Okay, can you see that? Yes, you seem to be good. Fabulous, wonderful. There we go. It's on I full will... screen and I'm going to disappear for a while. Okay, thank you. Okay, so hi everybody, welcome. I'm so excited to talk to you about the good death. 
um, Victorian morning rituals. And one of the things that I would ask you to keep in mind as we're going through this discussion is um, thinking about this not just as like, oh my gosh, look at these um, you know, uh, ornate um, features associated with funerary practices, but also thinking about in comparison to perhaps your own family's um, customs, um, what we do more on a national level, right? And what does that mean about us? What does it say about us in terms of how we, we work with, our, um, with the dying process? What does it mean in terms of um, how we handle our dead and who handles our dead? Okay. So let's get started. Now, the, one of the core components um, as we start talking through this material that I want to make sure that we're hitting on is that this material, um, you know, we're talking about the Victorian period. Um, this is from 1837 to 1901. And I want to immediately identify the fact that the opulence associated with this time period um, and the, the materials that they have to make all of the material culture with that we're going to be talking about, um, a lot of that comes from um, the combination of the transatlantic slave trade, which ended approximately 30 years prior to this, um, and then uh, in which Britain was making a large sum of money from, right? So it was trickling down even if people were not the, the owners of these ships, they were still um, benefiting from the materials that were being um, removed through enslaved people's labor. Um, and then also colonization. And I have, um, on the left, I have an image of the um, transatlantic slave trade and triangular trade um, uh, between the continents. Uh, and the uh, the benefits that it, that is to this area, um, and then to the right we have the colonized spaces that Britain uh, was in uh, command of of that time. Again, this was not their material, um, and they were ill-gotten gains. And I think that's really important to acknowledge. Um, I do want to bring your attention to this image at the top, which says, um, "Am I not a man and a brother?" Um, this was something that was embossed in pottery. Um, from actually the um, from the uh, Darwin's wife's pottery company, um, they were put putting this out and selling it to uh, raise funds against abolition, um, or sorry, uh, for abolition, so against slavery um, and trying to prevent um, the trade. Okay, so with that acknowledged, uh, let's talk about the Victorian period, right? This framing that we're in right now, um, that we're going to be talking about for the rest of the session. This is a period of dramatic social change. Um, we have uh, science is changing rapidly. We have an old earth and recognizing an old earth for the first time in, in the history of humanity. Um, we're talking about evolution through natural selection, right? We're um, looking at, we have all these incredible um, sea creatures, which were um, recognized and identified by Mary Anning, who is a, a female paleontologist who wasn't recognized in her time. Um, we had the industrial revolution underway, right? And that's part of that extraction of materials. Um, we had the great uh, exhibition in 1851, which is a way of showcasing all that Britain is producing and, and all of uh, Her Majesty's glory, if you will. Um, we have an emerging middle class so people are having access to goods and services that they would never have had um, in previous years. We have a morning queen, and we're going to talk about her in just a moment here. And we also have high mortality rates. Um, and so death is a core part and reality of culture. Okay, so as we move forward talking about the queen, I should let you know that my sister is named after Queen Victoria. So we're in very good hands here. So Queen Victoria. Um, queen Victoria is an incredibly powerful queen. Um, she's a very long ruling queen. Um, and she lost her the love of her life, Prince Albert, to typhoid um, in 1861. Now, everything that this woman does is seen as a trend-setting thing. So uh, if you ever have, if you are someone who celebrates Christmas and you have a Christmas tree in your house during that holiday, you have Queen Victoria and Prince Albert to thank for that tradition. Um, so this is a, uh, when he passes, it 
Queen Victoria never moves past his death. So for instance, she has her servants every morning lay out hot water for his shave, um, lay out his clothes, um, his medicine glass. Uh, she, they change his bed linens and they scrub his chamber pot on a daily basis, right? So this, again, this really extreme level of mourning. Um, she's dressed in mourning garb for the rest of her life. Every uh, family photo that we see is uh, either has a bust or a portrait of Albert um, in it. So you can see here that she is holding an image of him in this, this picture. And for those who are maybe watching on a phone and they can't see the images, um, I will make this PowerPoint available. So you just need to contact the Bellamy Mansion and they can forward it on to you. So Queen Victoria is an extreme mourner and she is an extreme trend setter. If Queen Victoria is doing it, you want to be doing it. And so this helped just absolutely explode um, the funerary trade. So I mentioned before that we have these high mortality rates. Um, and these are the average lifespans in the 1830s. Um, so uh, upper class males um, are living, uh, again, on average um, until 44, they're about 44 years old. Um, tradesmen, about 25 years and laborers about to about 22 years old. Um, and about 57%, think about that for a minute, 57% of working class children are dead by age five. I, this is, think if you're 10, if you have 10 children, between five and six of them are likely to pass if you're a working class family. So there needs, there, there's a, a, a need to be able to address this, this period in time. So the thing that I've always been drawn to about the Victorian mourning culture is that death is an open and ongoing conversation. Um, it is not this um, quieted, um, you know, put in a back room, like only talk about in whispers. This is a, an open component, even when you're not in the death and dying process. Um, so it, it, this leads to um, you know, really ornate coffins and really talking through in uh, while you're alive and healthy bur burial spaces and choosing more um, mortuary clothing that perhaps you'll be buried in before you've died or before you're, you're sick. Um, women made their own shrouds and sometimes, and this, this is the death shroud, right? And would sometimes include them in their wedding dowries, right? So they would, they would have those ready knowing that this is coming. The Victorians were very interested in controlling nature and figuring out how to control nature. And this is part of that control. What, what can we do? How can we um, look to our demise and handle it? There's also this obsession with a good death with a lingering death. If you've ever seen um, any Victorian drama, right? And if you haven't, I don't know what you're doing with your pandemic, but you need to get on it immediately. There's some just great pieces. But there's, um, or if you've read any Victorian literature, is these long drawn out death processes. There's this very much this um, spiritual readiness and yielding to, in this case, a Christian God's will associated with death and dying, right? Um, and the deathbed becomes a focal point, right? So the family and friends are coming to the deathbed or visiting the deathbed or sitting watch around the deathbed. Um, and this is a norm. Um, and there's this great value in last words, right? The idea that the words that you speak in your last breath are the ones that are going to be these deeply meaningful, connected with multiple realms and are going to absolutely um, revolutionize an, an understanding of your life, right? Um, for anyone who's ever been present for a, a death and dying process, uh, first, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to be there. I think that's an important um, piece. I, I, I truly believe that everyone should be present for a birth um, and a death within their lives beyond their own. Um, but last words typically aren't as exciting as we hope they'd be or as meaningful as we'd hope they'd be. But the Victorians had hope. So that's important. We all need that. Um, I do want to point out that um, because I'm going to be focusing more on material culture through this, um, I do want to point out that with this idea of talking about death and being open about death, they're also, you know, keeping their, their dead, they're dressing their dead, 
at home. They're washing their dead at home. They're um, perhaps keeping them in the parlor wrapped so that people can come visit, can people come some see them, the family can sit with them. Um, and it's a very different way than how the majority of people, for instance, in the United States interact with their dead, but we'll get there. Okay. So let's talk about clothing associated, right? Because there's all these material cultures associated with it um, that really help people connect in these different ways um, with the mourning process. So it is bad luck to keep mourning clothes. So as people are going through multiple deaths in their family, they're also going through multiple um, mourning outfits and mourning attire. Um, it also means that if you, if it's bad luck, which to me just reads as um, uh, someone's figured out how to advertise that, you know, you can get someone to buy more dresses, if you will. Um, but if it's bad luck and you don't have those dresses around, it means you need dresses um, made to your size immediately. And you don't have time to have the dresses actually made um, by a tailor or a seamstress, right? So this is a really important point in terms of fashion where we see um, this combined with a lot with military fashion, which Dr. Jenny Lazo is an, um, a specialist in at UNCW um, in the Department of History. Um, we see this as the part of the um, start of ready-made clothing, clothing that is not made for you um, or is not exactly tailored to your size, but it is um, something that you're wearing. Um, and this, at this point, especially with um, higher class individuals, these are the people who are, um, this is the one point they're going to be doing that. Um, and of course, morning attire takes all forms, right? There's um, clothing and hair clips and fans and parasols and purses. And as I will share later, it's really the women whose attire is very specified in terms of what they're going to be wearing. Um, anyone who identifies as male or masculine, don't worry, your morning attire is really easy in comparison to um, in comparison to um, women and femme identifying individuals. Okay, so uh, there's uh, Jays of Regent Street, like they end up making this, and this is a, a, a um, very popular store, they end up making this a part of their collections. Um, it's the fashionable place to go purchase. Um, and then what you end up seeing is these repeat customers. Um, and so I have a couple of um, examples of advertisements here associated with this morning wear. This, these are things that are in household magazines that they are selling, that they are in newspapers, um, that it's very clear that you can be fashionable while you're mourning and we have these when you're ready. Right. Okay, so I want to talk about a couple of different features associated with the Victorian mourning process um, and in, in more specifically in terms of the material culture um, of that process. Um, so I'm gonna talk about preparing the house, um, briefly about memorial cards, um, death portraits, um, death dolls, um, and clothing and jewelry. Okay, so in a household, much like my own Victorian morning household, one of the main components you're going to cover your mirrors, right? Um, and part of the reason for this, and there's a lot of different pieces to this, is to prevent souls from being trapped. So as the soul is trying to move into the next dimension, whatever that will look like for them, um, we don't want them to get trapped within the house, right? We want them to be uh, able to, to move on. And so we cover up um, any reflective services that might confuse them. Um, they would flip family portraits um, and any photos that they might have. Again, photos are very rare at this point and they're very expensive. Um, and, but this, uh, this helps prevent the spirit from possessing the living, right? This enables, again, the um, spirit and the soul to, to move on. Doorknobs are covered in crepe. So crepe is a, um, a, a type of weave of a, uh, of a cloth. Um, and so again, they, they would cover up these doorknobs um, between the days between the death and the actual funeral. And also you would draw the curtains and you would stop the clocks, right? And so in the household, you have this way of stopping and recognizing this death. Um, I will say that as I, whenever I visit this information and, and think about this information, 
I'm always sort of taken about how I wish that I had access to these kinds of mourning, not just because it's, it's, it's beautiful and um, it's, it's intriguing to me, right? It's, um, but because it's a way of processing and thinking and culturally working together to be recognizing death and mourning. Okay, so let's talk about uh, death portraits. So the uh, death portraits um, are coming out with this, uh, are, are becoming popular with this uh, type of photography that's emerging. Um, these are uh, various, there's a lot of different um, variation in what these death portraits look like. Again, photography is expensive. You perhaps uh, would go your whole life without having a photo of you taken, and it'd be a choice to have a photo of you of the, or, or of the family all together um, in the, um, in, in your death itself, right? In your death process. So with this, we typically see, um, or sometimes you see adults reflected, um, reflecting their, um, professions. So perhaps someone sitting at a desk writing, um, we see, uh, the natural position, so just sitting in a chair. Um, here we have, um, on the left-hand side, um, the woman in the middle has passed and she is being, um, she's sitting with, we presume is her family and getting this family portrait um, of her. Um, children are typically posed with a family member or a favorite toy. Um, so the, you can see this, uh, these two children, um, God bless them on uh, this one on the right hand side with all of her dolls around her. Um, the one in the middle has their eyes open. Sometimes it's, um, it'll be, they paint the eyelids. So to, to, um, mimic like actual eyes, sometimes they'll have the eyes open, um, depending on when those photos are taken, um, how soon after death. Um, and we have these poses that are, um, quote unquote, natural poses where they're standing with clamps. So there, uh, there's a whole, uh, market and a whole line of photography where individuals, you might be able to see here, we've got a, a chair, these are specialty chairs um, that are rigged with clamps and ways to effectively, we've got um, a way to like hold the head up here, um, to hold the body in a position to be able to capture these likenesses. Um, again, this is not seen as macabre. This is not seen as being um, strange. This is not un unusual besides the fact that it's unusual in that to have the money to be able to capture these, right? This is a way of working through death and dying. Uh, we have a woman here with her um, infant who's passed. Um, and, you know, again, it's like capturing these moments. And I think these are powerful. And we see these um, with um, processes, especially around, um, for instance, um, uh, uh, excuse me, um, what am I trying to say here? Uh, miscarriages, right? Um, and when an individual miscarries or has a stillbirth, hospitals frequently in the United States and Europe have photographers there who will capture your family together. Um, and we've seen that recently with famous couples um, sharing that photography, sharing them with their, their stillborn child right, as a way of keeping that as a momentum. And it's just, it's a really powerful um, way of recognizing that this person was in the world and that you are a family, even if this person has passed on. So it's a, again, um, same thing with uh, hospices and um, especially like children's hospitals and those have these kinds of services available um, today. Okay. So we can talk about, uh, for instance, uh, grave dolls. So we have these um, really incredible pieces. These are realistic wax effigies of these, uh, frequently of, of children who have died, babies who have died. Again, we have very high infant mortality um, and certainly those rates increase um, if you are someone who are, is of the lower class, but at the reality of this as one who is lower resourced, but the reality is it's still infant mortality is extraordinarily high and there's such extraordinarily, extraordinary loss associated with it. Um, these, depending on these dolls, so they have these wax effigies, um, they may include the deceased child's clothing. 
Um, so perhaps a christening gown um, or another piece of clothing that's really important to the family. Um, sometimes it will include their hair and incorporate their hair into this. Um, and these can be either left gravesite or at home. So in a glass coffin, um, they, they can be framed. Um, and then also sometimes it can be in a crib and kept within, uh, whether it's in the, the public um, greeting area, right, like your parlor, whether it's in your family space or whether it's in your private chambers, right? Again, all ways of processing and recognizing death. Um, you know, with this, uh, you know, we see mourning and grieving parents, you know, if, you've, if um, you have a friend or a family member or perhaps yourself who's lost um, a child or a loved one, you know, you can see them processing it through on, on Facebook or social media, right, sharing images and be able to, talking about them and being able to have them still as a presence, right? Similar things going on here. Okay, so you might be asking me, Michaela, how long do I mourn? Well, I have answers for you. So this is a very clearly defined period. And these are timelines that you can find in a, um, a lot of different uh, magazines, um, the time to really clarify what your pipe period is. Now, if you are a widower, um, you need to be in mourning for two years. If you are a child mourning a parent or a parent mourning a child, that's a year. Um, if you've lost a grandparent or siblings, that's six months. Um, aunts and uncles, two months. Great aunts and uncles, six weeks. And first cousins, about four weeks, right? So again, when we're talking about mourning, it's not necessarily your internal mourning process, right? But in terms of dressing um, for the, with the recognition of a mourning process. All right, so like I've mentioned before, if you were a um, man or masculinized presenting person, um, before the 1950s, effectively, you had to add a black mourning cloak to your attire. Um, so not exactly a, a dramatic reach, right, in terms of uh, transitioning what you're wearing. Um, after the 19, or excuse me, after the 1850s, um, you would not, you'd have your black mourning cloak, um, but you'd add in your, um, I have my, my black gloves here, right? Um, your black gloves, your hat band, um, you'd have that black hat band I'm going to show you here, um, that you'd add in a, a black ribbon indicating that you are in mourning. Um, and, but you could wear a regular dark suit, one that you'd wear for other occasions, um, but you would wear it more commonly. Um, men could socialize and go to work. Um, they were um, able, they had a lot more social flexibility when it came to um, the mourning and the expectations culturally of the mourning process. Women, you will all be shocked to hear, had much more complex um, cultural expectations associated with them. Um, that if they were not following, it was indicating that they do not care as deeply or they're not mourning as well as they should, right? So we see, uh, we, we know that women were more typically um, charged with caring for the sick and dying. Um, so, and they were also responsible for the preparation of the corpse, right? So if someone passes, washing the body, um, like handling the body, uh, combing their hair, um, taking care of them. Um, and this is, again, something that in, this is certainly some groups still do this in the United States, but something that we don't typically do as frequently, or it's seen as like, wait, can I do this? It, 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 people worry that it's illegal to touch a body after they've died. And if they've died of natural causes, you can touch the bodies. You can, you can love your loved ones. You can um, wash them and, and put lotion on them and comb their hair. Like that is, that is legal and it's, it's, it's okay. Um, so with this, we see that mourning dress is also more extreme for women. Um, and I'll talk about that um, a little bit here shortly. Um, they're also expected to be in isolation. Um, they're expected to minimize social interactions and really just focus on social interactions with a very, very um, small, dare I say, bubble of people um, who that they're um, interacting with um, and that they are um, uh, 
whether they're their family members, whether they are, um, you know, very, very close friends. Um, and they have different rules in terms of the type of morning attire they'd have over what would be the maximum of this two year period. So let me take these off. I see there's a little bit of a, a shine there. Um, and it could either be the spirits trying to communicate to you through my glasses, or it could just be my overhead lanterns. Okay. So again, we have some more death photography here um, with women uh, by the bedside or holding these infants um, and children. So in deepest mourning, so this is the um, earliest stages of mourning someone has passed. Um, you are going to be wearing non-reflective silks um, or cheaper fabrics um, that are not shiny, they aren't glossy, um, that are going to um, really, in, like a very dull fabric, if you will. Um, these are typically trimmed with crepe. Um, they're not wearing them with velvet or satin or lace or embroidery, right? Um, these are um, a very specific uh, set that you'll be wearing, right? And again, think about what this means to people who see you walking down the street, right? They can read these details and know immediately, right? Um, like we're right now in an election and people walking down the street, there are ways of identifying where people are on the political spectrum Right. Um, and in a similar way, we can look at these um, different attires and know where someone is in the process. So we see widows um, using uh, weeping veils. So whenever they're going out, these are again, a minimalized number of times they're going out, they're wearing these weeping veils. Um, I do have a hat here to share with you. Um, so you'd wear, we have this, this hat that's bigger than my screen, which I think all hats should be bigger than a screen, but that's just me. And you would, over this hat, you would pin a veil, um, something similar to what I've draped um, above with here. Um, you would drape it and you would, um, you know, cover yourself and cover your um, face. So you'd have these weeping veils. Um, uh, crying publicly was not seen as appropriate um, so that it would help prevent that. Um, and then you'd also uh, tie a black ribbon um, tied through your underwear. So it'd be like threaded through your underwear. Um, I tried so hard to find you an image of this and I'm so sorry that I failed. But maybe, maybe if I'm invited back in the future, we can talk to some of our amazing seamstresses in the group and ask them to uh, produce something that would indicate this. Okay, so there's a point in the morning process where you are slating the morning, where you'd be in effectively half morning. The crepe can be removed from your clothing. Again, the Victorians are, um, so certainly they're, they're, they're buying some of the pre-made material for that right as that death occurs or they're borrowing it, but you're also modifying the clothing as you go you. So taking off the trim and adding a different type of trim. Um, you know, you're really utilizing what they have in place. Um, so this, the crepe can be removed, um, the color lightens. So we've got uh, grays and mauves and lavenders and violets and whites. Um, I have a little um, uh, shirt here. Excuse me, I'm trying to hold it up. With that view. Um, this is a, a strong um, indicator of like what this would look like, right? These grays, you know, you've got this beautiful puffed Victorian sleeve, right? but it's a space that you're still indicating that you are in the grieving process, but that you're in a different stage of it. Um, I love this color scheme, and this is a color scheme which I find very interesting because it's very popular right now um, for uh, us. So um, you can add mourning jewelry and lace embellish, and, and that's a whole lot of word, embellishments. Um, I have some uh, examples here of, you might be able to see the, the shine off of these, right? And the idea is that it's still, oh, there we go, it's still black. Um, you are not wearing anything that's not black. I have some uh, earrings here to share with you. One day we'll be in person and we can handle all of these and we can get our finger oils all over them. It'll be fantastic. Um, but your, your, your stones are going to be all black. And I'll talk about those in just a moment here. But you're adding these in and you're, um, you're indicating that you're in this different stage of mourning. Okay, so let's talk about what this looks like in terms of this mourning jewelry. Um, so approved material um, includes jet, which is a black coal light 
like material. Um, and I have uh, an image in the bottom right there of this material. Um, if anybody is so blown away by this lecture and they want to gift me some jet jewelry or hair jewelry or any of this, please let me know. I'm happy to be your, um, the holder of these fine pieces. I just find them incredible and fascinating. Um, but, but more seriously, we see these materials that are um, woven out of the hair of the deceased. Right? So you can see these images in the top right hand corner, these beautiful woven pieces, right? And look at this incredible work right here, right? Um, and these are beautiful high fashion pieces of jewelry that let you keep your person near you. Um, we see uh, portraits incorporated into this jewelry, right? So think of like lockets, those kinds of things. Um, and we see even like teeth and glass eyes incorporated. Um, I have an image of that in just a moment here. So here's some image of some of these incredible hair jewelry from the Victorian era. And so all of these are crafted and shaped. There are specific jewelers who specialize in this type of jewelry. Um, and you may have this um, made and like added to over the years. Um, you may have multiple people represented. You might notice the different colors of um, hair in this. Um, and this is something that is certainly used for mourning, but there's also um, records suggesting people are, are using this as a fashion statement as well. Um, so it might not be that they know the person who it's made out of, but they're just enjoying the design, um, design of it and the, um, the uh, aesthetic that it produces, right? So truly incredible pieces, really gorgeous um, pieces that Again, you can wear and keep your person close to you. So I gotta tell you, these are some of my favorite pieces. I love hair jewelry, I love the jet. I mean, it's just incredible, but um, we have some examples here of jewelry that is made. Um, so we have a deceased glass eye, we have teeth that have been shaped um, into pieces of mourning jewelry. Um, so from these, from these individuals. Um, and so it's, again, these just different ways of incorporating people in. Now, I will share with you that these are less common ways. So it's less common to incorporate teeth in, less common to include um, a glass eyeball in, um, but it is something that we certainly see. And so sometimes people look at this type of jewelry and they, again, it's, it's a little bit of that like, giddiness that we get when we get to see something that's macabre and something that's so different from what we normally experience. And as anthropologists, we're really interested in the idea that it's like, we're not talking about what's normal, right? We're talking about variation. We're excited about variation um, culturally, biologically as anthropologists. We're also interested in different pathways and life ways of doing things. And what I will share is that um, you can still get jewelry made um, from hair. You can still get jewelry made from teeth, so um, especially the market is typically uh, focused on um, parents as children, um, as uh, as parents think to buy teeth back from the tooth fairy, um, they're able to incorporate um, those materials um, into different types of jewelry, um, which look really tasteful and don't necessarily look like teeth. Um, but they are also, um, for instance, you can make have your breast milk suspended in a polymer. And so you can have that made into a pendant and have some of that as a connection between you and your offspring, right? So this is um, different ways that we do this still today. Okay, so in terms of funerals, right? Funerals are extraordinarily expensive. Um, they're expensive now. They are so expensive now, but they are um, expensive for Victorians. And of course, the more money you have, the more expensive your funeral becomes, right? So again, very similar to what we see now. So you want a lot of mourners at a funeral, at your funeral, at your loved one's funeral. You would really want to show that how beloved this person is. And the reality is, is that you need maybe more people than you have in your social network. Um, so what you'll see is people hired um, and professions of professional mourners. Um, they're also called mutes. And so for instance, if you read or watched um, Oliver Twist, 
um, you see that in that book, um, children being hired as mutes at children's bu uh, burials. So then, then these children being hired to stand around and, and grieve for this child who's died um, on behalf of the parents. Um, it's seen as unseemly to cry at services, right? So you, as a family member, you need to be stoic and put together, but it, you want that mourning indicated. And so you may hire people to um, cry enthusiastically at the funeral on your behalf. Now, I will tell you, I'm very happy in my profession. UNCW has been very good to me professionally and career-wise, um, but I feel like an excellent backup profession for me would be a professional crier, because I can cry so hard at any funeral, and it's a little distracting, and I apologize to anyone who's ever been to a funeral with me, but when you mourn, well, when I mourn, I mourn hard. So, um, Feel free to hire me for those uh, events in the future if you're going to be having a Victorian funeral anytime soon. Happy to come and weep. Okay, so we always hear about um, the death and burial process and the concern about what happens if you're not quite dead, right? Um, what, what, what goes on then? And then what do you do if you're like half dead um, and no one knows? Okay, well, great question. And I have some good answers. So we know in this period, medicine isn't great. Um, it's, it's burgeoning. There's some stuff that works, but realistically, it's, it's a lot of still guessing at this point. And we also don't have great ways of picking up the pulse if it's very faint, um, picking up the breath if it's very faint. And so we have these reports and they're not super frequent, but as you know, you don't need them to be super frequent for them to be really terrifying and worrisome, right? So we see uh, these reports of people being buried alive after falling into what they call a sleeping sequence. So effectively a coma, and a comatose state. Um, so there's all these coffins that are designed um, that enable you to have a little bit of peace of mind um, that if you are buried alive, that there's a bell attached to the ring um, that you put on, on the um, person's head, the presumed dead person's hand, um, with a line that runs out of the coffin. Um, so then that way, if they move in any way, the bell will ring. Uh, and there's also people who are hired to be there to listen for these bells ringing um, in case they are um, tinkling in the dead of night. So again, this is something that was incredibly infrequent um, so that this is not something to have nightmares about. Um, not that many of us need more things to have nightmares about these days, um, but it's, this is extraordinarily, extraordinarily infrequent then. Um, so we have these other components. So it says at the bottom, premature burial is impossible when this vault is used. Uh, this person um, could live for hours in one of these compartments, or at any rate, long enough to open the cover by turning the hand wheel. Um, I'm just, again, going to go out on a limb and say that if I woke up in one of these, I would not be particularly adept at opening these up, right? I'm, um, so, but I like the concept. It seems very, very nice. Um, but here's a way of, of opening it from the inside and popping it off um, so that you can, um, you know, emerge and amaze your friends and your family. Okay, so medicine's not great, um, but to improve medicine, we need cadavers, right? Um, and at this point, it was illegal to um, use dead bodies in any fashion associated with medicine, right? It was seen as macabre, it was seen as problematic. Uh, but at the same time, this is how medicine moves forward. Um, so what we see, excuse me, popped forward there. Um, what we see are we call the resurrection men, um, people who are paid money by uh, medical pr practitioners to go and find freshly buried graves. Um, typically, these are graves of uh, people with lower resources uh, because they have lower um, ability to protect those graves, lower ability to, um, you know, uh, charge people if they, if they catch someone um, desecrating someone's grave. Um, but this is happening and we see that uh, on occasion medical students are paying their way 
by doing this, um, by, uh, by uh, disinterring people. Um, and so we do see these uh, grave sites that are uh, very intricate, these wrought iron that's going to stop anyone breaking in. So you're trying to let people out as needed, um, but you're also trying to stop people from getting in to these grave sites. Okay, so the question we sort of started with, and I asked you to start like rolling around your head is this idea is like, are the Victorians macabre? Like they have these, these, these really seemingly sometimes grotesque seeming behaviors. But one of the things I'd like us to keep in mind is that they maintained an honest understanding of loss and grief. Um, their rituals provided stability and refuge in the place, uh, in the face of significant social change. And their mourning created a powerful sense of being bound to loyalty in the past, right? So being able to connect with those who have passed. Um, again, this is a time where so much is changing um, in Britain and across the globe. Um, and so much is changing in, in, from one generation to the next. It's so fast paced. This is a way of, of connecting and staying connected with those that you love um, and those that are past. Um, and a way of being able to connect with those in your community to indicate where you're at. Um, we've, well, I'll speak for myself. I know that I've been in spaces of mourning where I wish there was a way that I could indicate to the people around me who don't know me personally that I am in mourning and I'm, I'm processing and I'm trying to, I'm trying to grieve. And, but at the same time, I have to go to the grocery store, right? And it's just, um, this is a way of being able to, to indicate to others in our community that this is where we are um, together. So when did this elaborate mourning uh, pass? Well, we see the reduction, a severe reduction in these kinds of elaborate mourning processes um, surrounding the Spanish flu. Um, this is, we've got national conflict um, occurring at this, this point. Um, again, we have um, people who are uh, spread across the globe in terms of the colonization process, in terms of military, right? People are, are moving abroad, um, people are dying overseas, and they can't go through these funerary processes. They don't have the materials to do them there, and it's challenging to do it overseas. The Spanish flu, though, really was the, um, if you will, nail in the coffin with a lot of these really ornate traditions. So many people were passing, um, and there was a, you see this um, increased interest in cremation. Um, you see um, so many people and families dying um, in very short order that when there's not the finances to be able to have these elaborate funerary practices, but also having the body in the parlor is no longer something that you want in case you may pass this on. Um, again, for those of you who haven't heard this already, the Spanish flu did not originate in Spain. Um, it was just that they were one of the only countries that didn't have a moratorium on um, talking about the, um, the death and dying associated with it because they were um, neutral in many of the wars that were happening at that time. And actually the first case was isolated in Kansas. Just, just saying as we're tagging diseases with names of countries, it's something to keep in mind. Um, so as we see this changing reality, we see a change in Victorian culture. And so that brings us to uh, talk a little bit about us. If you'll give me um, just uh, two more minutes here as I wrap up here. Um, we know that we're looking at death and dying in the US. Um, again, there's a lot of different cultural death and dying traditions. And so I'm, what I'm going for is a, a, the most common ones we see and the most common by, um, by dollar signs effectively. Um, so prior to COVID, um, we see that 80% of deaths happen in hospitals, right? So not in the home. So you go um, and that's part of the process or you're in a um, hospice or you're in a, in a center of some kind, um, which means that your family is removed from the process. It means that you may have someone at your deathbed, but it is um, not your entire family. It's not everyone surrounding you. And it also means that children are less likely to be part of the death and dying process. They're more likely to be shielded from it as opposed to having it as part of their um, existence and part of the existence of being in a home. Um, death has become a, a severely medicalized process. Um, it, there's a lot of money behind medicalizing death. 
Um, so keeping people alive. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the benefit of a, um, of a comfortable death. So keeping someone comfortable through their death and dying process versus keeping someone alive longer for the sake of keeping them alive longer. Right. So there are some things that we, we choose, we can choose in, in, um, in the process with families about, for instance, adding feeding tubes, um, what, which, what level of extreme will we take this to in terms of keeping someone alive for another week, two weeks, right? So again, that's a family decision, but one that we can make, and that we can be part of. Um, so with this, we see that profits start earlier in death um, and dying in the process, and that value is placed on separating living from the dead. This comes back to that, um, oh my gosh, someone's died in my household, I immediately have to have them removed. Again, as a natural death in a household. Um, and you don't, that's, that's, not, that's not part of law, right? Um, you can have your, um, you can, there's different laws in different spaces, but you can have your uh, dead person in your home, you can dress them, you can keep them, you can hold your wake there, right? You don't have to have a wake at a funeral home, for instance. Um, and, but again, it's like, that's an industry that's arisen actually fairly recently. Okay, so I do want to touch on in the time of COVID, right? We are in this extraordinarily flux in terms of our mortuary traditions um, across the globe. Every every mortuary tradition is going to be modified and changed. Um, we see that families are separated during birth, right? So the reduction in who can be in the room when you're giving birth, um, and during the death process, right? We hear people um, dying alone, people dying or, or with a um, a medical or first responder with them, um, but not their family member, right? This is very much transitioning how we interact. Um, the being able to go to a funeral and hold a funeral, which is then going to lead to other funerals, right? Not being able to to be with your family at this time when this happens, right? It is my my heart goes out, and we've had we've had losses in our family during this time, and it's been extremely challenging to not be able to go. So I, I share this image. This is a man who's holding up a sign that says, thank you all in emergency for saving my wife's life. I love you all, right? And um, thankfully she survived, but he's holding up the sign because he can't go into the emergency room at this point. Okay, so we've gone through a lot. Um, but I wanna remind you that uh, Victorian women could not vote, uh, but you can. Um, early voting ends Saturday, October 31st at 3 p.m. Um, and please, please, please get there. The lines are uh, short. They're moving fast. We would love you to be able to um, get, your, get your vote out there. Um, and I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being here. I thank you for taking these extra couple minutes with me. Um, I encourage you to come take a course with me. Um, again, I'm in the Department of Anthropology um, and we love having adult learners join us. Um, if you are a student in our courses or if you're a student at the UNCW, please come and take courses with, with me. Um, we do talk about vampires, um, zombies and the plague in some of my courses, as you indicated before. Um, this is our Facebook page, UNCW Department of Anthropology. Um, so you can join us on Facebook. Um, and also, I want to not only thank the Bellamy Mansion for inviting me, um, and also you all for inviting me into your home, um, but I also want to thank um, Debbie Shoy uh, Costumes. She uh, was kind enough to um, dress me for this event. She'll be very disappointed that I took my gloves off early, but friends, they're very hot. Um, and it gave me the, uh, the coverings and also anything I held up is from her collection. So if you want to have a costume made or if you're looking to rent a costume for an event in your home without contacting anybody else, um, Debbie is fantastic and I strongly recommend her. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I would love to take any questions that you have um, and let's, let's talk about some of this goodness. That was fantastic. Thanks very much for doing that. How lovely. Thank you. How, what a fascinating topic. I mean, it promoted so many questions and you know so many comments on there. I think people are just enwrapped by. Great. I don't macabre is the word, but also I don't know. It's just it's a rich part of history, right? Um, and an unusual one from our perspective now. Um, well, so and I, I think I think. Go ahead, man. Yeah. 
I was going to say, I think that we're really drawn to it because we, we lack these kinds of rituals today. We maybe go to a wake at a funeral home that we've driven by 50 times, but we've never gone inside. It feels disconnected. You go see your loved one being in a room that you've never been in before that smells strange, that doesn't fit, that, that doesn't, you know, it doesn't connect. These are ways that we see we can connect with death in a way that's meaningful and helps us live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I've got a bunch of questions. Some of them are sort of connected. So I'm, I'm going to start with one which is more broadly thematic. Uh, several came in, about four of them, about the photos. Mm. And it was, it's kind of along the lines of rigor mortis must set in at some point or another, yep. pretty quickly. Um, how much time passed? How difficult was it to set up a picture, a photo like that when the process of death was taking place? Oh, that's such a great question. And um, I'm glad you guys are, are thinking along those lines, right? Because this is not just a cultural undertaking, but a biological one. And so um, you have um, about like a 24 hour window where it's, you can still move someone pretty easily, um, especially if you've kept them in a cooler space. So for instance, we see, um, we see bodies being kept in a, a cooler room and like the fire's not being lit in there for that, that reason, right? It slows the decaying process. Um, but it's, you have that, a little bit further on, you can still mobilize someone, but that might require a little bit more force in terms of moving joints, right? But these are services that your dead or your loved one passes, and you you call on these um, these artists to come and, and set up and take these photographs, right? This is in a short order period of time that you're having this done. Hmm. Good questions, everybody. Good job. Way to think like an anthropologist. I'm really into the photos and, how, and the mechanics you just explained. Um, linked to that, would the de Melissa is asking, would you the death photographs be done for the wealthy only? Or was that a very common practice? Um, and who would prepare the bodies? Uh, photographers, the mortician, family members? Okay, another fantastic question. So um, as we can you can all probably guess if you have higher resources you are going to be more likely to have these photos taken right um these are expensive but we do see some middle class remember we have that emerging middle class and also some low resourced individuals who um have these images taken i searched i would like to say that i searched uh for images of uh lower resource families because i've seen them in museums i've seen them in books um and uh, I was not as successful as finding those. Um, similarly, I was searching for images of um, higher melanin levels, so uh, black individuals in Victoria, uh, in Victorian times. So uh, there are black people in England and who are at different level, uh, multiple levels of resources. And um, I just like to put it out there, if anyone has uh, access to those images, I would really like to have um, copies of those. So I'd love to chat with you. But who would be managing these? Um, you would have your photographer um, would be part, and they'd have a team that would help um, move the body. The families would be involved. Again, the more money you have, um, the more resources you have, the probably the less that you are directly involved in, you know, moving that your loved one's body um, for the photograph. Um, but for those who are lower resource, they might say, well, like they'll work as the assistant in these cases. Right, right. I, I'm just looking at my lighting. I, I look like a mortician. Oh, it's perfect. It's ideal. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of linked, but there's been a, a number of questions about, so this is about, a lot of this is about class, right, and race and location. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, so uh, history yes. and anthropology is all about those things. But how widespread, I guess, is the question are these practices? I mean, th there must be different a African American practices, for example. Mm -hmm. And this is mostly about English upper class or British upper class, I should say, and then um, American upper class that followed that tradition. Mm -hmm. So, kind of, how widespread was the stuff that you're talking about today? So, these are certainly the extreme 
um, you know, we're showing the, the extreme versions. We're showing the, the best jewelry, the ones that, these are also the pieces of jewelry that not only are they um, made with hardier materials, they're more likely to be passed down, preserved, right? Um, it, having families, having a space to hold on to materials, right? That's something that we can take for granted now when we have our houses, you know, stuffed full of stuff, right? That we're trying to get rid of it out the door. Um, but those are the ones that preserve and those images are the ones that preserve. The images for um, higher end funerary garbs and mortuary gowns, like if you are someone who is um, advertising your services with these, you're certainly going to advertise your most expensive gowns to get people in the, in the store for the lower price garb, right? So we have, um, what we know is that there are these practices that go throughout class and resource availability, um, but it would be modified potentially. So for instance, if you're a middle class, you know, you're likely not going to get rid of a dress because it's bad luck at that point. Maybe you just keep it for when there's a funeral again, or when there's a mourning process again, or you may um, modify it and utilize it and then modify it back, right? So there's, there's certain um, routes, but these practices are seen across class lines um, to one level or another. Right, that was kind of another, yeah, which came up, which is a good one, actually, Adam Smith. Was there a pressure to mourn respectably, I think you may have answered this, but among the working class? I mean, if you couldn't afford it, was there still pressure to dress a certain way and, and, and do what you can in that regard? Yeah, absolutely, and especially women, right? And one of the ways that that was incredibly problematic, right, is if you're supposed to be in isolation to show how much you care about someone who's deceased, but you have to go out, like you have to labor, you have to um, be out in your community. And so um, this comes into, there's some really interesting spaces here about, um, so I'm very interested in terms of, um, uh, if you will, like working class and labor um, families and thinking about this. Um, and actually Katie Peel, who is one of our professors in the Department of English, um, she's, an, she's an expert in this, um, this topic specifically, or not necessarily mortuary practices, but in terms of the, these groups. Um, but it's this idea of like, you're supposed to be doing this, but you can't do it to this extreme because you need to keep your family alive. But because you're not doing it, it's like, oh, well, you don't care enough about your family, right? That somehow you're not mourning as deeply and you don't take it as seriously because you are not dressing the full, all black, all the material yeah. um, components, or you're not, you know, so, uh, I want to say socially distancing, but their version of it. Right. But of course, it's one of necessity to keep your children alive, to keep your family alive, you have to be going out. But it meant that class wise, people who are higher resourced were able to indicate, oh, well, they don't like they, they don't have the same emotions, right? They don't have the same feelings or depth of mourning that we do as super bougie rich people yeah. um, who really need to stay home. So these are really important themes to be thinking about. You know, thank you all for bringing this up. Again, you're great anthropologists. This is, yeah, there's some great, I mean, we've got, we got time, we're on Zoom. Um, this is some great questions coming up, which linked to that one, right, that last one. So if a person chooses not to mourn for the amount of time or the requisite whatever mm -hmm. in society, do they get shunned? Were they, and, and, you know, if a class, what you just said, a class thing means that you can't afford it, mm -hmm. whatever. At what point, and this is a very general question, I suppose it depends where you are, but were you shunned? Were you, was that a, a faux pas that you couldn't recover from? So I'm, so I will say like, I, I don't know of course what happened in every circumstance with every person, right? Um, my, my understanding again is that it would be very different for men and women if they chose to not follow these practices. The Victorians were real rigid. They had really strict rules about everything, right? They were very um, uh, mechanistic and, and their expectations within culture and community that you were going to follow. Um, so yes, you'd expect some um, pushback, uh, certainly if you are a woman who's not following these, because as we know throughout history, women are held to a much tighter standard and expectations um, to be able to, um, be considered and present um, with as it decent and appropriate, right? 
Um, one of the things I love, uh, if those of you who are Downton Abbey fans, which I'm just gonna guess there's gonna be some crossover here um, in this group. In the first couple episodes of that, um, Mary is in mourning. The, one of the main characters, she's in mourning. And basically she's like, this is awful. <laughs> like, this is hot, it's scratchy. I hate not being able to put on what I wanna put on. When is this gonna be over? I don't really care that this person's dead. Real sad, too bad, but can I get back to my life? And I love that because the reality is, is like you're in this expectation and this cultural um, set of behaviors that you're supposed to have and be performing, but you're also a person who is like, yeah, that guy was kind of a jerk. And my husband was a jerk. I don't want to mourn him. Or, you know, that uncle, like, I don't even know the dude. How am I, like, why am I supposed to be dressed uncomfortably for this period of time and I can't go out? And you all know you had, you had stuff canceled with the pandemic and you're like, well, I want to go do my fun thing. Imagine if it was like, no, your great uncle died that you never met. And you have to stay home and be a good pious woman while everyone else goes out, right? So it's, um, people are people. Like people are, um, there's all sorts of responses to his death. But again, cultural expectations. Right, that's the thing, yeah. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah. That's a good question, that, a good answer. Um, let's think about, there's another one I've got on here really. How much was this, I guess, reached its peak? There's a couple of combo questions I'm going with. In the Victorian period. So Victorian period is 1837 to 1901, right? So mm. we're in there about 60-ish, 64 years. Is this, when does it start? When does it sort of fade away to be quite this particular about this kind of stuff? So in the, the peak versus the particularity of it. So we really see it peak um, about like within like five to 10 years of Prince Albert's death, right? Um, and I'm gonna look back at my notes for that, um, mm -hmm. for when that happened. Give me a second here, I hold on. To that fast, I find it. Okay, yeah, um, I'm a human biologist, not a death and mourning specialist, so here we go. I'm pretty so, sure story, I should know this stuff, it just comes to it anyway. Yeah, that's what I should have said, is like, well, wait a minute. Um, so 1861, he dies. Um, within five years, it's embraced widely. Um, within um, 10 years, it's the norm and expectation. And it's kind of like when Princess Diana got married. It took a while, but everyone needed a giant poofy wedding gown. And still we see those showing up and needing this, this huge princess gown. And we're, again, with COVID, I bet you we see that transition away from giant gowns, but that's another conversation and not for Halloween. Sure. Um, but it's, we see it, it kind of petering out and reducing. And it's really, again, it's that we get the Spanish, the Spanish flu that hits and it's done at that point. It's just, it, people are, are no longer following these um, traditions as, as closely as they were before. Okay. Is this, sort of related to something in here. Is this always the Christian kind of thing? Christian, Victorian mourning practices? Is, is other religions like copy sections of this sort of stuff or anything like that? Or we copy it from them. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, certainly um, the, especially the Brits are excellent at um, taking other people's cultures and creating them as their own, right? That's like, yeah, that's our- Taking them over actually half the time, but yeah. Yeah, there's lots of, uh, lots of pilfering and making it their own. And then it's um, high fashion when they do it. And then it's um, barbaric when other groups do it, right? Right. Um, and and she was so, the Empress of India, Victoria, so hey, yeah. Oh, goodness, yes. Again, that's a whole nother talk, Isn't but- so that's an excellent question, and I don't have a strong, helpful answer at this point, but it is an excellent question. Um, was mourning jewelry only worn during that period or afterwards? And I guess the question is going towards how long? I mean, you, you did a how long, but I mean, mm -hmm. could you then wear it? Could you wear an eyeball ring for the next 10 years, I suppose, something like that? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I, I don't know. I yeah. don't know. I, I, think I mean, I personally would wear an eyeball ring for the following 10 years, yeah. but that's just me. Wear one now. Yeah, um, it's Halloween. Why not? Um, I think you answered this kind of thing. We're getting to the end of these, but someone was the end of it was, 
He's saying they were much more apparently in tune and like linked to death, like as a, as a immediate mm -hmm. to it. And we are much more distant from it. Is that just a thing that sort of graduated over time to get from that point to where we are now, which is much more medicalized than what you said, the body is mm -hmm. removed pretty much immediately and all that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's a combination of the two. It's graduated and it's punctuated. Um, we see a transition in terms of the, and there's a the distinct space. Um, I believe it's, I wish I had a date for you, I'm sorry, like 1940s, 1950s-ish, where we see this transition in terms of the funeral industry and the funerary industry. And it's one of recognizing, okay, how do we advertise? What are we advertising? What is it that we are, where, where are the spaces that we can further our services, which means expand our bottom line? So this is not to say that all funerary services or parlors are um, evil or undermining, right? But at the same time, there is a bottom line associated with them, right? There's a reason why when you are going to shop for a casket, for, the, for instance, they recommend that you don't go in, like the, the, per, like the widow doesn't go in, the um, child of the deceased doesn't go in. It's like someone who's close to the family, a very close friends, a close cousin, they're the ones going in and making decisions and also bargaining because you can bargain down prices for um, coffins, for instance, right? And you can, you can order coffins today. You can order coffins from Costco's, same coffins that you get in showrooms, but for so much less money. But again, that distancing us from death and dying and not thinking about death and dying earlier on puts money in the pockets of those practitioners, right? Um, so in the interim with that, so we see that changes. We also see that's a point where in America, especially there's a lot more money, right? Because we're coming back from World War II, families have money, they have um, uh, white people, I should say, have access to land and access, for instance, to suburbia. Um, it's being built and they have access to these funds in a way that they hadn't had before. So it's taking advantage of those additional funds and availability um, at that time. Same thing with medicalization, right? We see a transition in the medicalization around death and dying. Um, and that is also partially associated with capitalism. And it's partially associated with uh, where's, where decisions are being made, right. right? In terms of, do you prolong, like I said, do you prolong um, death or prolong life when it is not uh, a comfortable life? Um, where do you make those decisions? And I do want to say, I don't say any of this lightly. Um, I worked as a nursing assistant for seven years, part of how I put my way through school. And I was on um, a team that was specially associated with uh, death and dying processes, right? So being with people as they are in their final stages of death and dying, being there, uh, washing the bodies um, and working with the mortuary staff uh, and processing. And then also seeing families swoop in who haven't seen their loved ones in years, coming in and putting in a feeding tube in the last days, trying to prolong their lives. And it doesn't prolong it comfortably, right? Again, these are conversations we can have. And it's not the way it's done around the world. It's not the way, for instance, um, in England, where my family's from, it's a, it's a very different process of death and dying. Um, yeah, yeah. I think, and yeah, and people are asking that kind of question on here too. Is this a way of sanitizing living dead interactions, like as the US becomes more health focused is one question. And then mm -hmm. another one is, does the idea of this good death still exist? Mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, well, I mean, we're becoming more health focused, but we spend, it, it's, we spend more money per capita on health than any of our, our sister nations, but we have some of the worst health outcomes of any nations. Our, for instance, our, um, pregnancy and birth outcomes are some are just atrocious, right? We are absolutely terrible. Um, and definitely at the bottom of the pile for our sister nations. Um, and of course it becomes worse if you're part of a minority group. Um, and so yes, we have more interest in, in health, but also there's a lot more people who benefit out of that process and the financial components. Um, and so it's again to be thinking about the systems in which we enact in and what is, um, what's, the, the, what's the, just the way it is versus what can be changed and how can that be improved uh, for more people. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. Um, 
for the, I'll do two more because there's mm -hmm. 30 questions on here and I'm trying to get through them. They're very good. Um, there's one about how do you preserve eyeballs, which I suppose in the same way you preserve other parts of the body. Oh, uh, that's a good question. So there, um, you know okay. if you're talking about eyeball rings, they're already glass. So they're glass like you've lost an eye because of something else. And it's just a, a glass eyeball that you would put in um, to, you know, take up that space. Um, and so it would be that eyeball that would be created into Tory. Um, mm. In terms of it, in terms of photography, you got to move fast. You got to move fast. Anything that's got a membrane is going to break down very fast in the body. So think of like your lips, think of your genitalia, um, your nail beds, um, your uh, gums, right? Your eyes, all of those items are going to uh, decompose faster than anything else. Right. Yeah, that's just interesting to be thinking about that stuff, right? Um, Let's see. Oh, well, one is why didn't they take pictures of their loved ones when they were alive? That's a decent question. It's good question. It's expensive. It's yeah. so expensive. And it's like, and the thing is, is, is this is part of death. These are great questions. Oh my gosh. Um, these, yeah, I, I like put my glasses on and I could read them and I'm like, oh, that one and that one. Um, so it's expensive. And also death and dying is part of the process. So including them while they're alive, you've got the other family members standing around while they're alive and surrounding the, the dead loved one. Hmm. You're going to have to tell people your email address or something at the end of this, or they can look you up so they can sure. shoot some of these questions at you. Cause it's, it's I mean, I I'm going to pop my email address in the, yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't mind sticking around for this and there's 115 people still on, so. Yeah, I'm happy sticking around too. If you need to go because like, I you don't. want to be 115 people here, no, that's no. totally fine. Go do your thing, but also stick around because <laughs> there's some good questions here. No, no, I like this. This is fascinating. Right, I'm gonna put my email in the chat um, and I will tell you that it's a busy week, right? It's coming up here. So if you don't hear from me immediately, don't hesitate to write, forward it to me again, um, especially by like mid next week, um, for instance. Um, I'm happy to chat about this. Well, here's a good one, which I don't know, I've touched on this African American history, but how much influence does the Gullah culture have on death and mourning in our society? So that is a fantastic question. I will say that it is um, because the Victorian era that I'm specifically speaking of is Britain, right? It is England um, during that period. Um, and so the death and dying processes during the same time period in the States, that's an entirely, that's a different cultural talk. Um, there is, as far as I know, so that doesn't say much because this is not, again, this is not my um, lifetime specialty, right? I didn't get those letters behind my name for this topic. Um, but we don't see those traditions traveling back across to England and influencing, right? Again, I, I may be very wrong on that, um, but I think that that is an excellent follow-up um, talk for someone yeah. to give. And I, I'm just thinking, if someone ever asked that question, where was that? Donna Sarabian, the person at the North Carolina Museum of History, uh, Michelle Lanier, who's done a lot on uh, Gullah culture and the Gullah Her Heritage Corridor, which ends, the northern end is Wilmington. Uh, might be more into that topic, actually. Uh, well, and be and knowledgeable about it. I can make up so many excellent answers for you, but I'm guessing that you actually want reality and fact. So, yeah. you know. Um, <laughs> so, Rebecca Lawrence, is there higher pressure on women to abide and isolate based on the assumption of the more emotional nature of women versus the logical nature of men? Is that why they have to be isolated, kept out of view? And tied to start with the sexism, obviously, but is this tied at all to the increasingly that rational psychological approach being applied to female hysteria? You know? Oh my gosh! Yes. Okay. So we should be best friends. Let's start there. So yes, a very core component. So there's the layers. There's all sorts of layers of sexism in this, in terms of the assumed um, natural predisposition of women, right, and the idea that they are um, sensitive flowers, you know, there's the whole, like, they're going to faint over anything. And what we, of course, know is that women are badass throughout history. They are tough broads, and they are um, undermined throughout. We know this, right? This is not a surprise. Um, but certainly the idea of, like, no, they need to be coddled. And it's not even being coddled. It's like, no, they need to be socially controlled in this period. 
Um, in terms of the higher resourced individuals, there's certainly uh, material written about the idea of keeping a widow, a young widow woman from falling into the ensnarement of a, a young suitor, right? Which could be inappropriate um, and or really exciting depending on the book that you're reading. Um, or, and also in terms of resources, family resources, right? Who owns those resources? Who is it that, um, what would happen to those resources now that the husband's died? Does that woman have them? So we all know these incredible characters um, that we love in literature and, and TV where they're like, uh, I'm never marrying or now my husband died and I have a bazillion dollars and I'm going to just tell you what I think. And it's like, they're the best. They're, the, they're who I want to be when I grow up. Um, but certainly it's about control. It's control of women. It's control of femininity. It's control of emotions. Um, it's control of who has a right to mourn and grieve in the way that they want to. Um, and it is just it's just junk. It's just like how we, um, in especially in the United States, um, we talk talked throughout history about how um, Black and African American people have less nerve endings, or they have they're um, more prone to emotion than logic, and it's all just junk, right? It's not actually based on anything, but the um, people in power's decisions about what what makes sense for them. Okay, sorry, that's a whole nother. Yeah. Everything's another lecture. But again, yeah. come take our courses. As I said, like I said, Katie Peel in English, Jenny Lazo in, in history, my classes will blow your minds and change your worldview. <laughs> you promise. Or your People money back. Funerary art on here and how they want to know about tombstones. Mm -hmm. Vampires has come mm -hmm. up a couple of times. Mm -hmm. What other things Victoria led us to do? So that's, you know, there's three more lectures right there. Oh my gosh. Yeah. With. And then was one about. When the covering of the door knobs with crepe, you know, what's that about? When did that happen? Why? And you know, all that sort of stuff that they do all I that. don't know, but can someone please do a presentation on that? Because I want to know. Um, I think I'm getting to the, I think that might be the last one. Yeah, prior to the official, yeah. I think that was about the Victorian period. Again, I think we've covered that. Um, that's a ton. That's, that's just a ton. We need to come back and talk about vampires. We do need to do that one. Right. So what he's referring to here is that um, a portion of my, so I teach intro to biological anthropology, which is the study of the intersection between biology and culture. Um, Y'all, it's the best. And in that I talk, uh, there's a section on vampire zombies and the plague, and we examine it through a biological and cultural lens. Like why, where do these um, stories and understandings come from and how can we look at them in these different angles. Um, I do want to give a shout out. I see that um, there's people, there, there are former students of ours, graduates of ours, there are current students um, within our department that are on here and hi everybody. There's um, students from UNCW who are in other departments, delighted you're here. And I want to give a shout out because I know that there are some of my loved ones that are in Washington State um, <laughs> who are on here watching and some of my um, youngest friends um, and my, I've had wonderful friends who have managed to make me lovely nieces and nephews um, over the years. And so they're here too. And so I just wanted to say hello and welcome and um, That's very come, cool. to, come to UNCW. It. It's going to be a great place. Got the very last one because somebody asked me because it prompted me for it. The term living room. Anything to do with Victorian funerals being laid out or anything like that? Say that um, one more time. Which living rooms? Did the term, did the term living room Mm -hmm. Comes a byproduct of Victorian funerals or anything like that. I don't know. I assumed it was the main room because we had one in my grew up as the main room of the house where people amass like a family parlor here in the Bellamy Mansion. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know, but you know what I do like? I like that that's our final question and I get to answer I don't know because one of the exciting things about being a researcher is being able to say, I don't know, but I want to know and I want to learn more and I want to think more about this and talk to other people who are experts or people who are excited about this and be able to connect these dots together. So um, right. I actually really appreciate being able to say, I don't know, but let's find out. I know, I'm just going to put in, you're just not sure, but, and also um, that could be a thesis topic. Yes, please. Someone please go do their thesis on this. Again, UNCW history, uh -huh. like we've got an amazing team. So 
I, I went there and you know, hey. See, you, you get it, representing, no kind of cool. hawks. I'm gonna put in my plug for come to the Bellamy Mansion, tour with us, the slave quarters, very rare to find an interpreted slave quarters anywhere uh, mm -hmm. right behind me and then the house uh, here as well. So there's a lot of that history. We need you, we had six months closed. So we need mm -hmm. everybody to come and visit us from our community. Um, I, I will also put a plug in because I recognize that you are very polite and will not say this. If you've got extra change in your pockets, consider donating to the Bellamy Mansion. Like they, they use the funds well. They're not squandering any of these funds, as far as I know, right? These really historic, these historic homes are treasures in our community. And, you know, we, we're all a little thin right now financially, but you know, do consider um, supporting them and supporting yeah. events like this. Well, thanks. That actually goes for, we've been talking during COVID times with all the other museums, the Bergwin Wright, the Latimer House, Poplar Grove, Cape Fear Museum, everybody is just in the same boat with six months closed. So everyone you, needs help. If you're interested in this stuff, engage with their programming, engage with the places because it's incredibly valuable that we do this right now. Um, I think that's it for right now. We've, yeah, we've, we've, Talk and talk, it's been great. Um, oh, hey. one, one more plug. Oh, yeah, oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah. oh my God, I'm so sorry. You guys, I know that you all have to go eat dinner and go talk about this amazing talk. Um, I do want to put in the, hang on, and I can't spell. Um, okay, so there is in town here, we have the I Love Vintage Social Club, which you can find us on Facebook, um, do a search, and we are through um, Second Skin, Again, can't spell. Through Second Skin Vintage, um, which is an incredible vintage shop on Castle Street, which is inclusive um, and very purposefully so. Um, but so if you can't find us through just searching Second Skin Vintage, you can use them to platform through. But we meet once a month and we're just a group of people who love this kind of stuff and love talking about um, culture and all these different um, uh, perspectives. Um, we are a very, um, purposely a very intersectional group and community in terms of discussions and about what we're talking about. And so sometimes we have world experts on a topic that are sharing. Sometimes we have someone who's just like, I love this topic. I want to learn more. I want to share about it. But do find us on Facebook and join us and come and just hang out and enjoy some really good community and good discussions about, you know, beautiful clothes and um, recognizing how class, gender, and uh, race intersects with all of these things. Cool. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for doing this. This has been wonderful. Um, this will be up because of recording it uh, on our website. What day is it? Probably next week, probably after the election. Great. We all need to take a deep breath for Tuesday. Um, holding tight uh, over here. Yeah, we're all holding tight for that. Uh, it'd be nice to have it be passed at least. Well, hopefully it'll be passed. Uh, anyway, but this will be up on our uh, website. We have a YouTube channel. And we're part of Preservation North Carolina, which has a much broader as well uh, shelter series, which has all sorts of great lectures we've been doing for the last six months or so. So you'll find it there, you'll see it posted, and I hope you'll tell people about it to come and engage with it because, you know, it'll be out on the internet for as long as there's an internet, I suppose. Um, but yes, Michaela, thanks so much for doing this. This has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I hope thank you. you. It was wonderful. Yeah, thanks. Karen. Thank you. Find us on Facebook. Is there a way for us to save the chat so I can read it later? Is there a special button for that? Yeah, that's a or has it gone into the ether? I have no clue. Um, <laughs> somebody can tell me that. I guess it'll get recorded. I'll find okay. out. When I close this down, I think there is a way, but I don't know what it is. Um, oh, and I'm sharing my email address one more time. Someone asked for that. Thank you. Um, I can't find a way to copy it, but if so. Okay, can... Leslie Cohen, um, who is fabulous, um, she just said you can download the chat. It'll be on the recording. Okay. So it will save as a file on Zoom as well, I, I feel. So yeah, all right. It's, it's, it's one of our librarians who said that it would be on the recording. See, librarians, man, librarians. they know their stuff. Absolutely. All right, I'll you copy and paste so it just in case. Oh, oh, thank you. Right. I'm going to save you this. And be in touch if you have any questions, all right? Okay. Thanks very much Bye. again. Go vote! Yes, definitely. Bye, everybody. Good night, all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.